Um, good day, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Martin Overma at uh, Leuven University, and it's a great pleasure to share some of our insights on what we call intrapreneurship and how that relates to leadership at teams of individuals and in organizations. Um, I'm professor at uh, Leuven University in Belgium, and um, this is supposed to be uh, in Europe the most uh, innovative university. So in that sense, it's interesting to reflect a bit about well, what we, do we know about innovation and uh, what are we talking about? Well, in this lecture, um, I like to explore with you what is entrepreneur and uh, what is an intrapreneur, because we're focusing on what we call intrapreneurship. Who of you likes to be an entrepreneur uh, and what do you do being an entrepreneur? And then how can we promote that as an individual in your team and also in your organization? And why would you want to do that in the first place? Well, we will discover those issues on the run of this lecture. So key learnings would be today, what is entrepreneurship? Uh, what is also an entrepreneurial team and what helps and hinders entrepreneurial behavior and what should leaders particularly do and what should they not do to promote entrepreneurial behavior. First of all, let's take a closer look at entrepreneurship. Um, also uh, in Poland, many people young people but also older people dream of becoming an entrepreneur and uh, you see many startup companies growing uh, developing new products new services uh, making inventions etc and uh, well how does it look like what are we talking about so do you consider to be an entrepreneur um, what we see is that in uh, many societies, also worldwide, women are less uh, initiating to become entrepreneur um, and also are less successful when it comes to turnover, money, uh, revenues uh, of their business. Several things are hindering women to become entrepreneurs, particularly uh, for example, stereotypes about women by uh, financial institutions and investors. They ask very different questions to women compared to men um, about their experience, about their expectations, etc. So these are stereotypes. And secondly, uh, men are often oriented to other type of businesses than women. So one key point here is what can we also encourage women for um, entrepreneurship, but also intrapreneurship. Well, um, here you see two successful women. Um, on the Forbes cover, you see uh, Kylie Jenner, and some of you might uh, know she has made it at 21 to be the youngest ever self-made billionaire. Um, part of the Kardashian family uh, and um, well becoming so famous and also so financially successful is an achievement of course. Um, you might want to consider well but is she also an entrepreneur? Definitely very successful as a businesswoman but what is she doing? Well, she is particularly very successful as influencer and she made that into a business model but did she really invent something new uh, maybe form of marketing maybe a form of influencing uh, which was successful but the products are not really new um, that she is bringing so it's mostly a marketing success so we should differentiate between business and success in business and entrepreneurial on the other side, we see here a um, former student of mine who was um, 
the uh, entrepreneur of the year in Belgium as a young successful woman. And um, uh, her story was also a bit about caring products. Um, and it was based on the allergies of her daughter. Her daughter got allergies and she didn't find the proper products, so she developed a new line of completely vegan, healthy uh, skincare products. And what it says here, do what you love. So it took her quite some time to become a bit of successful, but now she is making uh, good numbers and growing as a new business and new products. Particularly, it says here, do what you love. Now, when we talk about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, this is a key part, making new things that come to mind. A famous example, of course, when we talk about entrepreneurship is um, in the automotive industry. And here you see Elon Musk, according to some richest men in the world, and um, the men behind, among other things, Tesla. Uh, the car that really changed the whole automotive industry in many ways and set set the benchmark. So it was a really a highly innovative new thing. And for many years, uh, well, Elon Musk was taking high financial risks and uh, not so successful at all. However, over time, uh, he got, of course, uh, uh, great successes with this line of uh, business. Um, so he became also famous for it. And for many young people, this is a kind of dream model. I'm be a risk uh, innovator, great thoughts, and then come to new ideas. How is that when you are disruptive in the industry, coming with total new concepts, something that is changing the whole dynamics? What about VW, another world big car producer? There we see two lines. One hand, the let's say traditional car producers, the Golf, and they are still changing and innovating that car, reducing the uh, carbon footprint of the car, make it more sustainable, changing uh, better motives, better facilities, etc. That is what we call incremental innovation or incremental change, and people are working hard on that team next to what we call radical innovation. But if I would ask you, well, give me a name. Who is here the big name of the uh, automotive and the uh, new design of the, the ID3 from, the, uh, uh, from VW? I would wonder if anybody would know that, because that is less visible than the whole new innovation uh, that we just saw from Tesla. Well, here you see him, for example, Frank Bekemeyer. He is the CFO from e-mobility at Volkswagen. And um, well, in Germany, he is well known and recognized as a, an important driver of the change in the automotive industry in uh, Volkswagen and, and generally in the automotive industry. However, my point here is, who do we know within Volkswagen who is doing the change, who is developing new ideas? And this is where it comes to intrapreneurship. Evidently, behind Frank, there are many clever people. On one hand, the whole department, as we call it, research and development, and also in other fields, people coming with new ideas to promote innovation in organizations and that is basically what we talk about when we talk about intrapreneurship that is all those actions that imply renewal in the organization at different levels we will come to that so the difference between an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur is that the entrepreneur is own boss has a lot of freedom and takes high risks. And the intrapreneur is usually employed in an organization. It's uh, uh, at different points in the organization, takes therefore less personal risks and experiences less freedom. 
because she or he is employed in that organization. However, comes with all kinds of new ideas, maybe big ideas, small ideas, but stays employed and usually therefore also much less visible, both in the organization as well as on the outside. So why would somebody be an intrapreneur or an entrepreneur? And here you also see gender coming into the picture. And uh, we see here for a first part, well, why would you start to be an entrepreneur? Uh, so that is a choice to be self-employed and below it. There are push and pull factors, both in yourself as well as on the outside. Uh, you can get fired. Uh, um, you don't see much uh, alternative opportunities. Um, the organization has a limited resources to let you grow. Um, but also the push factors that push you out, but there might be also pull factors that draw you to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, that might be market opportunities or innovative ideas you have for yourself. You think, well, I can do better myself, so why wouldn't I do it? Well, you might not want to do it yeah, because of there are factors that keep you inside. Um, more push factors is that you're not happy in your job, yeah? um, that there are family constraints. And so there are many factors that influence your idea of, well, why would I become entrepreneurial? But for organizations, this is often a loss. If you lose your best people with the best ideas because they want to start for themselves, it will not help your organization to become innovative. And uh, this is where intrapreneurship becomes so important for organizations to promote that. So we see worldwide a strong development for intrapreneurship because organizations know they need to change. Um, how to promote that is to bring in people that are really competent to make a change. Well, of all, there is always a fantasy like, well, some people are just very smart. They are the brains, they are creative and they just have it. And so an entrepreneurial spirit or um, a free mind. However, it's also about in the end behavior. And the question is, well, do you believe this can be taught just like any other behavior or not? You just have it or you don't. Well, depending on what you believe, you will encourage this behavior more. You will bring in specific people that are really innovative and others. Well, you don't have any expectation of that. And also for yourself, yeah, these are called what we call hindering thoughts. And in our research, we clearly demonstrate that yes, intrapreneurial behavior can be taught. You can boost it, you can stimulate it, uh, just like many other behaviors. So it's important for you to realize this and consider, well, what are thoughts? Why am I not maybe doing this? at my work. What we see is many people who are not very innovative at work are very creative uh, in their um, sports teams or in their hobbies or in their family or how they go on holidays. So there is an innate creativity most people have, but do you apply it? And are you invited to use that energy in the workplace? So what is entrepreneurship? First of all, we should look then at the organization and then we talk about what we call corporate entrepreneurship. Well, of course, that is the organizations uh, like we saw VW, Volkswagen uh, uh, and all kinds of organizations that gear policy towards entrepreneurship and they develop what we call an innovation strategy 
uh, they set up new products, new departments. They have a whole line of what we call research and development where they invest a lot in, in new uh, strategies like Volkswagen reserved uh, 30, uh, over 30 billion euros for the development of their E uh, line of cars. So that is major investments in their innovation. It's at organizational level. If we go to the personal level, employee level, there we look at, well, opportunities and taking action by employees. Do they demonstrate that they are proactive, see opportunities, that they are busy innovating and also wanting to take risks to do that? And are they complaining or resisting the way it always has been done? This is a good strategy because we always did it. Well, then entrepreneurial behavior says, well, I don't see the need why we continue doing things as it is. For example, now after COVID, many people worked from home uh, using new technology to teach, to do processes. And then some will say, well, we go back to the old routines and others say, please not. We have learned something. We can innovate here. We have to update our services um, and be more uh, available using our technologies, doing better services. Um, this morning I was talking to colleagues who in the healthcare, for example, are we using um, e-consults for doctors? Can uh, electronic consultations, uh, information sharing towards patients, um, which promotes efficiency, promotes comfort for patients who can stay at home and talk to their doctors, or do they all want to go back to the old routines? Well, we have seen in the COVID period massive forms of intrapreneurial behavior. And uh, at the same level, we see many people coming with ideas of how to improve, how to reduce waste in the same industry. You might realize that hospitals are in fact creating massive amounts of waste. So becoming more of a sustainable industry, you want to have creative employees coming with ideas and then it links to the organizational practices. Now, one golden rule we know from many studies on innovation is that on one hand, people don't like to be changed, forced into new changes, and that is from the organization top down. However, many people in organizations do have a multitude of ideas how to improve the way we work. However, most organizations underuse that. They don't listen to it, they don't ask for it, they don't involve the normal worker to come up with their ideas to innovate, to change. And that's a great loss for both sides, for the organization as well as for the employee. Because you get frustrated if you can't share your insights and your ideas. So when we take a closer look at that intrapreneurial behavior, what are we talking about here? Well, um, there are several components in that. First of all, there is what we call proactivity. Uh, you think, well, this could be a problem. How are we conducting our job in COVID time, for example? That means proactive, being proactive in your job, as well as sharing that ideas in the team, because we organize our work usually in a team, and then at organizational level, we also have to organize. So to be entrepreneurial, you have to take actions individually in your team and in your organization. I already mentioned the difference between incremental innovation. We improve our car, it's the sixth generation, we still can improve it. Uh, or 
we change the whole concept and that is radical innovation. But you can apply that to many levels. In a hospital, you can think of well, how can we improve the routing of patients or the communication with patients. But you can also go for a radical innovation. We don't invite the patients inside anymore. We, we invite them to communicate, first of all, online using new devices, etc. That's quite a radical innovation. And then you already feel, oh, well, that might be very impactful. Is that wise, etc. And that brings us to the third part, and that is risk taking. Risk taking as an individual, because I'm changing the habits. And maybe it will not work well. Maybe I put the patient at risk. Uh, the same as a team of health care workers. One of them is taking risks, others not. But that creates confusion for patients. So is this a good plan? And where are the boundaries of one being very entrepreneurial, changing things, and the other might not want to do it? So there you get into conflicts in the team. And of course, the organization says, but we have also legal obligations. There are monetary incentives. There are rules. How are we reporting on this, etc.? And it all results either in strategic renewal of the organization or as we call that corporate venturing. You build up new ventures out of the old one. Well, we see that sometimes you have a little startup on a specific domain. Say, so, well, you might want to work now with, let's say, um, e-health care for patients. And uh, in this uh, city, we have a special organization focusing on that or technological eh, innovations where you say well our uh, Volkswagen has started a new branch for e-mobility or for uh, uh, producing uh, electronic buses or those kind of issues. So it might result in new organizations in the end. Well, I already mentioned everybody has something uh, capable of doing new things. However, not everybody is ready to do that. And here a psychological famous theory of planned behavior might be helpful to understand well what is needed to promote that intrapreneurial behavior. And to come to that behavior, you first of all have to have the intention to do it. Do I really want to and intend to behave differently and start experimenting uh, in a new way. And uh, before you start experimenting and have the intention, intention is feed it by do you want it? Do you see the need? And are you able to do it? First of all, do I want it? That is what we call the attitude. I would really to change my way of working. I would really like to experiment and eh, teach more in um, uh, new ways using uh, short video lectures, for example, for my students that they can look at any time, giving them short assignments. They don't have to come to class all the time. That is a the desire to do things, attitude. I'm dreaming about that. Then the second one is a subjective norm. Uh, if uh, all my colleagues say, uh, Martin, it is important that you change your way of working because we are already doing this. We believe this is the future. Uh, you cannot continue in the old way. Then there is a subjective norm to change. And then I also will feel the need to do that. And then, of course, the question comes, but am I able to do it? That is what we call perceived behavioral control. So I want it, I see the need to do it, and I'm also able to do it. Perceived behavioral control, and that builds up. Yes, I'm going to do it, intention, and then, in fact, I'm actually doing it. For example, I start teaching in new ways. But if the organization says, well, uh, Martin, this is not, uh, not the idea, it's not allowed, it's not how we want to work, 
of course, then I can still have the desire, but I'll be, my intention will become less strong because I think, well, I'm taking much more risk if I really change my way of working here. If a doctor in a group practice says, well, I think I should call much more to my patients for video calling, because I think that's more, that's better for everybody. And the other colleagues say, no, no, we want to see the patients really here. That's important that I see with my own eyes how this toe looks like. Then you understand this subjective norm is unclear. And again, you get tensions in the team. So building on the attitude alone is not enough. You also have to invest in the team and often we feel like, well, but how will that look like? Do we have the technological assistance? Do we have the infrastructure? And are we able to work with new technologies, etc., cetera, to, to start exploring? So a little experiment, please take a paper and pencil for yourself and you might want to think about the past year. Now, this was, of course, also a COVID year, so there was a lot of pressure, in fact, for intrapreneurial behavior. And uh, it's worth to reflect a little bit about, well, what did I change? Um, what ideas did you have? So first we have the ideas. Did you have to improve anything in your work? in the workplace, in your team, uh, in your own work, uh, in the tasks that you want to do. And maybe you say, well, there was nothing to improve. I just had to do it. And it was already very complicated and challenging under COVID oh, man, because I had to work from home. Well, this is also considered improving because we're responding to a change in the environment. So you have to adapt. And what ideas did you have personally to do that? Of course, you might want to reflect a little bit about that. Ideas is one thing. The second is, well, what did you do with those ideas? For example, did you talk about it? Or was there anybody asking for your ideas? So review the past year. Was there anybody asking your ideas on, well, how can we improve our way of working in the COVID time? Or when that was not relevant, generally, just over the year, what can we improve? Uh, if nobody asked, well, did you have any ideas? Yeah, did you feel invited to share also? Because if you don't talk about it, well, then you might change something. But if others don't even know it, it is, might be a bit uh, uh, risky. So third step is, of course, which of those ideas did you set into practice? Please reflect about it. Well, what were all my ideas uh, and um, which one came into practice? Uh, that can be that you say, well, I want to be more creative. So I took uh, every day one hour to walk in the forest to think about new ideas. And then um, uh, I did uh, or I did close my mailbox every day for a certain period of time so I could focus more and that was really a productive change. Because this intrapreneurial behavior relates to all aspects of your job. It can relate to what we say technical innovation, but it can also be a social innovation, changing the ways of cooperating, of working introducing new rules, how to communicate, how to work together, to be more um, effective, but also gain more energy at work. Um, so that brings us to the change. Did those actions, point five, result in any positive changes? And in what way did you see that? Did you measure but, or also others? And did uh, also other people that you work with implement these changes? So what is the overall result? Is there an overall result? And uh, how does it look like? And what factors helped then the success or hindered the success? 
Now you might have already uh, quit this conversation at uh, point two because you said, well, I didn't have any ideas. Uh, and no, I just did my job and uh, I was uh, doing it as I was told. Then it might be good to do some serious reflection on yourself and say, well, am I still in the right place? How much pleasure do I have at my work? Am I really challenged to use my ideas, my competencies, uh, my qualities at work? Or is it just same old, same old, I just continue with what I'm doing? It might mean that you are at the risk of becoming redundant. As we know, is there is a long time, all the same type of job and nothing changes, then often a dramatical change happens. So incremental small changes, continuous improvement is a, a sign of vitality. It's a law of nature, if you like. If, if you say, well, uh, nothing changed here. Think about yourself. Is it time for me to change? Why am I not invited to come up with any ideas? Am I uh, not interesting enough by uh, your organization, by your teammates, by your leader? So what is going on there? And maybe it's time for you to do some actions here. If you fill in this, well, focus on particularly the factors that help success or hinder success and how can you improve that? And I hope that in the overall result, you also note something about pleasure, satisfaction in your work, because it's a core um, essential need of us as, as human beings to be, to feel that we are competent, that we also can use our competencies and competencies both in the physical sense that we are able to realize anything, but also our brain, of course, that we can produce new ideas and are critical towards our environment. So let's see who is there as a person, the I entrepreneurship in the team. And um, some people are different from others. So what about entrepreneurship in a team? Can we stimulate that? Is that always good? Those elements we want to focus on now. Here we have again the model of the theory of plant change, but now at the team level. And again, also as a team, it's important that we develop an attitude. Yes, we can do this. We all want to do it. We feel also from the organization some form of norm, the subjective norm. And we also are facilitated. We have the opportunities, we have the capacities, we have the materials to do it. The organization invests in us, in our team to develop new routines, um, develops in us for equipment to do new behaviors. That all contributes again to the sense in the team. Yes, we want to go to new behaviors. Um, Again, you might want to reflect about this period of um, COVID. Uh, what happened to our team? And did we see changes at team level? And uh, for um, teams, there is a nice term, ambidextrous teams. And that basically are teams that are looking for the changes at two levels, both the small incremental changes, as well as the opportunities to really come to new uh, and uh, even uh, bold or greater changes. Now, when we talk about entrepreneurship, is one thing is thinking ideas, generating ideas, being creative, looking for opportunities, and you also have to put them into, as we said. So, and for your team, that means I have ideas, we have to talk about it, we have to decide, and then also go into action. Well, many ideas somehow stay at the drawing table, are not even shared, are not optimally used. 
So we start usually with a creative phase, we call exploration. What are possibilities to improve our team? Are we still doing the right things? And are we doing this in the right way? Or should we make some changes? And second stage is what we call, I would say, decision making and then implementing these changes. And then exploitation. The exploitation phase is indeed that we work with it and get the benefits of it. Of course, then you evaluate and see, well, we have to go through a new circle of change. So this entrepreneurial team is both innovating and that's also what we call a learning team. A learning team is constantly looking for opportunities and putting them in action and reflecting on that and again uh, refining. Well, do we really need all to be innovators in a team? And uh, there is many studies looking at that, but this is, uh, I would say, no, it's not so clear from the literature how many of those new people you need to. Um, because in a team, it's much more important that you value each other's quality. And if there is one creative person and uh, the rest of the team is, is open for those ideas and say, that's a great plan, let's try it. Of course, that is more productive because that will get more into action than when you have five people, all very creative, many ideas, but the conflicts between the ideas are hindering to come into action. So too many, too creative persons is uh, usually uh, creating a bit of chaos. And good leaders have to work with that to, to see that resulting in anything. We'll come to the leadership soon. So, what is very important here is that there is a good team atmosphere in which also creative ideas are welcomed. But this might also result in some worst practices. And uh, well, as you see this uh, example in the picture, uh, being in the pool together can be very creative, but then also drinking alcohol and putting electricity in it. Well, you might predict the outcome here. I'm not sure these two guys are surviving their business party. Um, so the team might actually not survive too much experimenting when there is not a safe environment. And uh, this safe environment is sometimes lacking. So what can help to stimulate entrepreneurship? First of all, and I asked you already to reflect about your own job. What is my job? How much autonomy do I have? Can I decide anything for myself? Or am I just following the orders? And am I just everything is structured? So I don't even am invited to think because I cannot decide anything. Do I also have external contacts? So do I get feedback on what we do? Do I get ideas from others, how they do their job? Uh, and particularly what we know is if you get direct feedback from clients, customers, students, patients, uh, that feedback is creating awareness that you might need some changes. There is always room for improvement. That is a cliche and that cliche is true. But if you don't get that external input as examples, but also as, as really sincere seeking for feedback, like, well, what can be improved? There is not a push to keep thinking and changing. What also helps is that there is some variety in your tasks. Uh, if you always do the same, you develop very strong routines uh, and you don't use your brain anymore because you just use the routines. So variety in tasks helps you to stay flexible also in your mind. Um, and it brings in new skills. We have two sides of the brain and these need to cooperate together 
If you activate this more, it helps. Secondly, is corporate entrepreneurship. So how is the climate in the organization? Um, is everything centrally located? Yeah? Uh, and uh, to what extent is there some freedom in decision making that relates to the autonomy? But this is also promoted by the organization. Is there uh, recognition for new ideas? Um, is there time available? Um, I once with some colleagues did we did an experiment in a administrative organization and uh, they were not very innovative. Teams were not working nicely, etc. Everybody felt pressure, but in the meantime, under the table were piles of uh, unprocessed forms. Um, we sit together with all the teams and say, well, we might need to allocate time for the team to change. And uh, then the management of the organization took the courage to say, OK, on our proposal, one day a week, you do not have to do the primary work. You just work, evaluate together and look for ways of to improve one day of the five. So they discussed every week one day and they experimented one day. What can we do to improve? And within half a year, that organization changed dramatically. It became much more productive. People were more happy they, because they were invited actively to think, what can we do better? What are we going to do with these piles? How is it that they're still under the table? Ah, these are very complicated cases and, and uh, so uh, we don't dare to touch them. That's not good. How are we going to deal with it? So one day of the five in a week was used simply, so that's a lot of time to develop new ideas and to implement and experiment with it because the ideas having is not enough. You have to also implement them. Well, there are also at more societal level uh, and uh, at sectoral level some pushes to entrepreneurship. You all know, of course, well, there are some sectors that need to change. There is a lot of investment going on. There is a lot of pressure for change. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, if people feel a lot of social security, they will maybe go easier on their own uh, because then they say, well, there is a safety net here also when I am unemployed, when I fail. Well, very important lesson from all our work on this element is that people differ. Now, this seems like an open door, but people really are different and it's complicated for organizations to adapt to different people at need. So more and less proactive individuals usually have different needs and uh, more proactive individuals often need more freedom to act, to think, to be productive than people that are less proactive because proactive people already think, well, I want to do this and this and this and then it will go better. What is not good to do generally? Uh, if you're just focusing on production and there is no time for reflection, you will not come to any serious changes. So the good practice I just shared with you, uh, if you take one day a week to develop new ideas, to experiment it, to evaluate that and to re-improve that, will boost the team much more than that you have one time half a day to generate all kinds of ideas for practices and then you say now let's go back to work because we don't have time to further implementation that's just creating frustration um, evidently continuously putting out fires being in meetings not being available to really think out of the box will not help you um, still take away uh, ideas from the people that bring them to the table. Uh, 
that is really an often common practice where readers simply first say, no, no, it's not a good idea. And then half a year later, you see it at once at the board meeting and then people say it's their idea. Well, that is really frustrating and of course also morally very poor behavior. Um, some people and also leaders tend to uh, get a bit uh, tired of all ideas and brainstorms, so they want to see directly a business plan. How is this going to bring money? Uh, how is this going to be effective? Well, that is of course suppressing creativity. Then people think, well, I haven't got everywhere and, and I thought through everything, uh, so I'll keep my mouth shut. Uh, that is a pity. Um, and uh, if people say, well, entrepreneurship, it's just another hype, forget it. Uh, people just have to work and do their own work and uh, for the rest, uh, it's their free time. Um, then a classic one is, uh, well, we have tried that before. And um, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, other forms of basically saying, well, I'm not so interested in your ideas. It's not you in the first place. So that is, we don't appreciate, we depreciate ideas of people. Well, of course, that is not stimulating you to share any ideas. You'll think, well, if they really want to change, they can ask me, but for the rest, I'll keep my mouth shut. A loss for the organization. And you might come at a point where you say, well, I didn't get any question, so maybe I should use my energy and my intelligence and my ideas better in another environment, either another company or I start for myself. A last one is really, really a bad practice, and that is when you communicate that you can't fail. Failing is not an option. Well, then you don't dare to take any risks, of course. What would happen if you fail? A very famous classic example was a manager who had been experimenting quite a bit and that resulted in a major multi-million loss. And it was my IBM and it was uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates. So Bill Gates, very long time ago, invites this manager to his office. And this manager in America, you get easily fired, as you might know. So he thought, well, I've made this multi-million loss, so I might get fired. Uh, Bill Gates told him, no, I'm going to promote you because you were had great ideas, you took a risk, okay, and it failed, not a problem. Please continue being innovative. Now, of course, if that becomes a story in the organization, people will come up much more easily with new ideas and also try them out in practice. If you create the feeling that failing is not an option, people will be risk avoidant. Being risk avoidant will result in less innovative behaviors. So my question to you would be, well, what is the climate in your organization? What are you feeling? Is there room for improvement, for experimenting? Is there room for failure? failure or simply try out. Uh, are people welcoming that? Um, are they welcoming your ideas? Or is it basically high pressure to get results? And uh, for the rest, good luck. So make a little assessment about the climate in your team and your organization on this. Um, Anderson and West, famous authors when it comes to learning and development in teams and effectiveness in teams, say, how can we create this climate for entrepreneurship? First of all, there has to be a clear vision. Um, is there a higher order goal? Uh, are we motivated to work as a team? And of course, this vision has to create some clarity, which should be reachable, but also a bit of a visionary nature, and it has to connect us. And uh, many teams don't have that so clear. Uh, 
And in that case, well, you don't really feel connected to the team. You do your own thing. I think, OK, we're here, nice colleagues. As we go for a beer, but we don't have a shared dream. Um, and it's also not a dream that is concrete enough to work for it. Secondly, participative safety. It's also called psychological safety. So that means that if you share ideas or you raise your voice, you give your opinion, that this is uh, not hold against you. You're not directly criticized or seen as stupid or seen as somebody uh, uh, that is not uh, fitting in the team. So can you have open discussions um, where everybody feels welcome to share opinions? It might also be that you are the person that is usually being the critical one and uh, saying, oh no, please, we have seen this. Oh, this is boring. Uh, so reflect if you do such, if you have too strong opinions and also are critical towards others, they might feel, well, I better keep my mouth shut. I often see that in, in for example, teams with young people and older people. The older colleagues then are kind of dominating the discussions and the younger people uh, are a bit uh, careful, waiting, thinking, well, if I raise my voice, I might basically get all kinds of comments and feedback. Then you know this is not a uh, great participative safety in the team. We already talked about the task orientation. So share focus on excellence of the task performance. If you really are aiming at the best, that is seems a bit contradictory with the no failure, but it's very important that you keep always the idea of, well, everybody has to contribute to the team. We want to do a very good job. We control, we evaluate, we give feedback. The best restaurants in the world develop always such an excellence of task performance are really critical because you can see, you can taste, and you see the plate, you taste the food, you know if it's OK to be presented to uh, in, in the restaurant. And so there is a very critical look on how to perform. Um, that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, make a mistake. Everybody is able to make a mistake or to experiment with some food. But you want to create a safe space where you can do that experiment. So that is the support for innovation. Approval, support for trying new things. If we take the example of the restaurant, of course you try out new things, but maybe you first do it in a safe space. You try it on yourself with the colleagues. You see, well, how does this taste? Is this a good idea? Would it work? You set up small pilots where you can really try out things and you appreciate that you want to do that. So there is a climate of we constantly strive for support. You can come up with all kinds of ideas and some might be a disaster. Some don't taste horrible, are poisonous. OK, this is all part of the game of innovation. Now I want to talk a bit about leadership, how to spur this entrepreneurial spirit in the organization. So uh, here you see the cartoon. Uh, what did you grade did you get? I got an A, really. Boy, I'd hate to be you. I got a C. Why on earth would you rather get a C than an A? Well, I find my life is not easier. It's a lot easier the lower I keep everyone's expectations. So there you might find the reason uh, of uh, not being too entrepreneurial. If you set the bar high, others will also bring in those expectations. And uh, well, then you have to live up to those expectations. So staying low is sometimes for people a choice of comfort. And of course, being the leader in the team, you also feel comforted. Let's all not put the bar too high. Let's not strive for excellence. I definitely don't want the recognition as my restaurant because then I have to keep up high expectations if people come here. 
with high expectations. So uh, I don't want a Michelin star on my restaurant. And I just want to stay on the ordinary. Well, that's a fair choice. However, it helps if you communicate that and then people have different expectations. By the way, of course, restaurants might have different ideals uh, than to gain a Michelin star restaurant. It is what you define as your aim of quality and of excellence. So we on the sideline kind of already discussed a bit, but my question to you on this is what do you expect from your leader? So how does your ideal boss look like? And what leadership behaviors help you to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative? Take a few moments to reflect upon that question and uh, think, uh, well, how do I look at that? What, what is my ideal boss? Does your boss now stimulate you to be entrepreneurial? How does she do that? Is your leader helping you, facilitating you? All those elements might play a role. Is uh, she stealing your ideas? Who knows? It's worth reflecting. And if you have clarified your ideas, you might think, well, to what extent have I shared my ideas with my boss? Did I talk about this at all? When did I talk about this to my leader? Uh, and uh, put my boss this on the agenda or not? Well, if you have the idea, well, my boss should put it on the agenda, otherwise we're not going to talk about it. That is not what we call proactive. So uh, my most proactive co-worker, I'm the boss, always initiates, Martin, we need to talk again about uh, how everything is going. And uh, I'm always very happy when she says that, she says, oh, great. Uh, because uh, it wasn't popping up in my mind yet, but if you want that, great. Let's sit together and have a serious talk about uh, how to improve the work. How are you doing? What can I help you to to stay happy and uh, to be innovative and etc. So don't wait for your boss to put it on the agenda. Be proactive. That is a core part of entrepreneurship. So what do entrepreneurial Employees like you, I hope, expect from a leader. Two sides, on the content of the work and also on the relational side of the work. Let's first look at the content. Now, very importantly, and I would say most people like that, but particularly people that are entrepreneurial, that want to grow, to be innovative, they need feedback. So also they expect from a leader, and if you are a Leader, please give careful attention to what extent am I doing it? Give feedback. Now, feedback should not be confused with criticism. Feedback is primary, also appreciation. Thank you. This was great ideas. You're active. We appreciate that. People are not easily tired of receiving positive feedback. And usually we give too little of that positive feedback. However, it should be sincere. If you are just trying to please somebody, people notice. We are not stupid. People notice that, well, this is just bullshit, what I'm told here. So positive feedback as well as critical feedback. What you can improve because entrepreneurial individuals like to grow, like to improve also themselves. So that's important to also focus on that. This means that you prepare as a leader, you should prepare. And also if you are having a meeting with your leader, invite the leader to prepare. Of course, there should be freedom and trust this autonomy. Very important. Do what you think is important. I, as a leader, I don't want to know how much hours people spend on their job unless it is too much. So I trust that you will do your work in a good way. And if I get the indication of not, we'll have a talk. Um, 
then there is also what we call a challenge to grow. So you explore where is the room for growing here? What can you improve? What are new tasks for you to develop? Or how are you doing it now? And where can you where can you improve? Um, top sports persons, top musicians, uh, top cooks, all are focused on one thing, and that is the challenge to grow. Always try to achieve a little better. This this level of uh, perfection in writing, in performing in um, shooting the penalty, um, etc., is so important as a driver. However, as a leader, you want to challenge them. Last week, one of the most famous conductors worldwide passed away, Bernard Heiting, um, world famous and highly respected by uh, the musicians. The musicians uh, who are all, particularly in this case in the uh, um, Amsterdam uh, concert hall, uh, they have been brought to a higher level by him and they all said, well, he really trusted and stood among us and was a musician among the others and challenged us constantly to grow. Um, ask advice as an expert. So that means that you also consider the qualities of your co-work and say, well, what do you see? Not only telling, but also asking. Be clear about information. Uh, what's going on in the organization? What do I know from the environment? Um, and of course, if there is a request for a decision, you also make it and you don't continue to linger on, but also create clarity. There's a confusion between giving freedom and giving clarity, both are important. On the relational side, as a leader, being an inspirational role model uh, is not so easy for entrepreneurial individuals. So they're critical and you have to walk the talk. Inspirational role model means that you're also critical to yourself, able to learn, uh, not putting yourself out of the picture, but seeing, well, how can I improve? Um, personal connection and attention helps people to be motivated. Um, having also attention for personal life, personal circumstances, personal needs. Well, I already mentioned the show of appreciation, right? not only the critical, but also the continuous form daily base. If you do this only once a year, forget it. It's, it's useless. We have seen that in many studies only appreciation once a year is totally fake. So you show appreciation the moment you see something positive happen. And that can be that somebody is there uh, despite uh, uh, sickness in the house. Um, and you say, I'm really appreciating that you want to do this for me. But if you spare that up, forget it. Ensure an informal and decentral context for entrepreneurial individuals to grow this is important that people feel at home and they also feel autonomous and that it means that you don't centralize everything, but leave room for decentralized decision making. What are good practices? Well, I already mentioned uh, that also leaders should adjust to their differences among the employees. Some need a lot of structure, others don't need that. Uh, some need freedom to operate and others cannot cope with that. Uh, now, there is always a tricky thing in this uh, because also employees, team members compare and they say, why are you allowed to do this? And I don't. Why are you receiving these opportunities? And I don't. So this means very important to be clear in your communication to co-workers. Um, also, people have to grow in a job. So if you say, well, I'm giving opportunities uh, and people fail in that, well, this is like educating, like growing. Don't get discouraged. Don't think, oh, I have to take over. Sometimes I meet leaders who say, I am doing all the work because my team members are, are less capable than I am. 
But if you're not able to delegate, this person worked 14 hours a day because his team members, well, he didn't he didn't trust them to, to grow. Um, very important, give employees, give your team members the why. Why is there a problem? Think about that. Uh, not simply saying this is a problem, solve it, but reflect about what are the causes of it. So focus on root causes where you can really make a change. Offer a potential piece of the solution. And often when you can relate that to one of the team members, you can put that person and that project and that activity on the shield. Don't put it on yourself, but put a coworker, one of the team members as a good example. Of course, don't always take the same person because then you have favoritism and people will hate that person. Um, pay personal attention for coaching support throughout a process of change. And don't say, well, this is what we do, or you let people swim a long time and then at once you start pulling the strings again. That is not the best way to do it. And focus on both opening, starting a project as well as closing behaviors. Well, then what is important is that modern theories on leadership define this as a two way street. That means that you particularly invite also co-workers, team members, your subordinates to give you feedback, to help you grow, to improve you. Uh, that means there to build an open and personal relation. Show yourself also as a person who makes mistakes and learn from each other. Well, I mentioned this example of one day a week and uh, as a just to stretch your mind like, OK, we can do that. And some in the literature, it is sometimes also promoted. You should devote 20 percent of the time to innovation. Well, that is not necessarily the practice. It is a mindset and it should be built in the daily practice. However, please keep in mind that being entrepreneurial yeah, also takes time and you want to challenge and discuss that is also an investment. A little example we worked on um, and published on is uh, the e-tail. So that is um, e-commerce and there was um, with one of the market leaders in the Netherlands uh, who is very successful there, constantly innovating um, and um, who had was basically a post order firm and with deep red figures, but they made a turnaround early on time to become an e tailor. Hugely successful. Everybody in the Netherlands knew, knows the company and many new customers, and they again innovated into a new way of using their platform, still successful. And what did we learn there? Well, the first phase, and that takes quite a bit, is that entrepreneurship is something of few people uh, experimenting, unfreezing, try out pilots, increase team leaders' autonomy to allow initiative. Then the major change was going to instigate the entrepreneurship at organizational level, uh, taking out thresholds, formalizing for more idea sharing and here the website really launched and become very successful in 2006 and then uh, you rebrand and the overall entrepreneurship was implemented in the organization and particularly the celebration uh, and the reward of success and continuous adaptation was implemented in the organization so there was a culture where people celebrate their successes, they challenge one another, they keep on innovating, and this is a, a moment of rebuilding your success and continuous that success. Um, so, this brings us to our summary. I hope it's clear that is, intrapreneurship is 
a continuous process that most people have by nature. It's a natural way to keep growing and developing and adapting to changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. However, we have to grow it. We have to breed it. We have to stimulate it. Otherwise, your best talents will leave your organization and become entrepreneurship. Become entrepreneurs doing their own business, feeling free, being independent, which is also great for society, but for your organization, it will be a loss. What is an entrepreneurial team? Well, that is a shared knowledge where you have a vision, where you want to achieve something, where you really want to learn from one another and stimulate each other. Um, modern organizations are often built on those teams. However, entrepreneurial behavior in the team is not automatically welcomed. So we have to create an environment where also people with new ideas are welcomed. And for that, you have to invest time and to invest in a good climate. We discussed what helps and hinders entrepreneurial behavior at different levels. And I hope you also reflected about your role in that. Am I entrepreneurial in my way of working? Uh, and what is my relation to my leader and to my team? Do we really learn from one another? Is my leader open for me? What can I change in that relation to promote? As we know and have seen, leaders play a key role in stimulating entrepreneurship by being human beings that want to grow and learn themselves together with the people that you work with. So I hope this also helps for you to have fun in your work, to keep changing and growing and developing. And with that, I would say thanks a lot and wishing you great times in an innovating working space. Bye bye.